2022. You are listening to the new WCEG Network on WCEGTalkRadio.com. You can hit us on at WCEGTalkRadio.com and then click the live screen, live stream. You can hear us there, watch us there. Or some of you might not like to watch. You can just listen. Say, gosh, I don't want to look at that guy. But anyway, I am Norman A. Carter, Jr., and I am your host for this installment of Issues and Answers. And I'll be with you for the next hour or so and reminding you that we are the Worldwide Community Empowerment Group. That's what WCEG stands for. You may like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and on Instagram at WCEG underscore talk underscore radio and at WCEG Network. Last but not least, and that's very, very important today, the topics and opinions that you hear on this program, totally mine. I don't have any guests. They're totally mine and not the WCEG Network. So leave my boss alone especially with that copyright infringement nonsense. Do you hear me? I'm talking to you. All right, let's get with it. We have a lot of topics to get into today. As you notice, I don't have a guest host with me. I would like for you out there to be my guest host. And you can do that by being a friend of WCEG on Facebook and texting in your questions on or and comments on any subject that we may be getting into or any subject that you deem to be important that you would like to, to get into. So I have uh, got so many things I want to get into, but first I just want to start off with the hot topic of the day. And that's what's going on over there in Ukraine. Now, the one thing I, I will tell you, and I do apologize to everyone, Unlike ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox News, all these other stations, we do not have teleprompters. So if you see me looking down, it's not because I'm going to sleep. It's because I have something I need to read. Okay, so understand that the object is to get the message. And speaking of message, let me tell you this right now, that I may not always be right but I try to be, okay? I try to be, and if I'm not right, I can take your opinions or your facts, and we can talk about them and discuss. And you know what? I've been wrong many times before, and I might be wrong several times today. So I'm going to leave it up to you to educate me if I kind of go off rails here and lose it. Please feel free to type in, tune in, Call in, type in by Facebook, your comments and questions. Now, Donald Trump, the name that some of us don't like to speak, 45th president of the United States, was impeached for the first time by the House of Representatives of the 116th United States Congress on December 18, 2019. The House adopted two articles of impeachment against Trump, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. And the Senate, which was largely Republican at the time, acquitted Donald Trump on February 5, 2020. Now, Trump was impeached because he sought foreign influence against presidential candidate Joseph Biden in the 2020 presidential campaign. He attempted to blackmail Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky into providing disparaging information against Biden in exchange for foreign aid. Now, there's the July 25th, 2019 transcript of that phone call and a witness who testified in Congress about this. He was a whistleblower, and I have an affinity for all whistleblowers, who suffered for doing the right thing. Ironically, this whistleblower was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vidman who was born in Kiev, Ukraine. 
His family left there for America when he was only four years old. So he has no memory of the country, but his grandparents are buried there. Now, Zelensky, that's the president of Ukraine, refused to make a statement about this and felt he should not become involved in American politics. Now, that refusal is not a denial. He just refused to cooperate. Now, Trump felt that because of the Ukrainian government's long history of corruption, that Zelensky would be fertile ground. It did not work. But this long history of corruption is one of the reasons why Ukraine was rejected in its application to join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And for those of you who haven't had history, that's called NATO for short. Prior to last week, Ukrainian President Zelensky publicly ridiculed American intelligence information, ridiculed American intelligence information about an imminent Russian threat. Do you remember that? America. Some of you never watch national news. Some of you don't watch the news at all. But let me tell you, he ridiculed the United States intelligence information that there was going to be a Russian invasion. He and the Ukrainian public joked with news reporters about the news of a threat. We are not worried. Russia has threatened us before. Nothing will happen. They were as wrong as those of Shalom who laughed at Noah or those who laughed at Gilgamesh much earlier in Uruk of Samaria. In ignoring information from America, Zelensky failed to mobilize his military or put them on alert until it was too late. That is neither the fault of America nor NATO, okay? Don't tell Tucker Carlson of Fox News that because he is pro-Putin, just like his buddy, Donald Trump. You have to be accountable for your actions or inactions. I've been saying that all week and some people were upset with that, but it's true. And do not be Republican and rewrite recent events to suit your desire to hide your errors. To quote Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, uh, he, the whistleblower, he said this yesterday or day before yesterday on WBUR about an interview uh, about, and about an, or an interview about what's going on in Ukraine. He said this, Donald Trump, Tucker Carlson of Fox News, and Mike Pompeo former Secretary of State, have blood on their hands. I would like to add, and so do their supporters and enablers right here in the U.S. of A, waving those flags, both American and those for the original American insurrection that we call the Civil War. Now, we're hearing about Africans educated in Ukraine who are crying racism because they feel the Ukrainian government is prioritizing effectively removing, removing its citizens from danger before they remove them. And there have been some stories that we can't verify about uh, African people saying that they were pulled off trains uh, and white people were put on crowded trains to replace them. Don't know if that was true, but here's what I do know to be true my African cousins. Were you listening to the news a month ago when the United States of America told the world that a Russian invasion was imminent? In fact, they weren't just spouting off words. The United States removed its embassy from Kiev to Poland. In addition, for several days, the United States government implored every American to leave Ukraine. 
particularly Kiev, because of the threat. Were you listening? And I direct that just to my African cousins, but also to the Ukrainians. Were you listening? Were you listening to our government? Or were you listening to Tucker Carlson on Fox News? Think about it. Blood on their hands. Sadly. So I don't totally blame the government uh, for you not working to preserve your own health and welfare. You have to take some responsibility because you stay just like the folks who laughed at Noah. Think about it. Now, Vladimir Putin, Vladimir Putin, the Russian president for life, basically. My, how history repeats itself to those who are ignorant of history. In April of 2021, those of you who paid attention to the news, the second longest serving president of Russia signed into law a referendum that would allow him to run in two additional elections and set the possibility that this 69 year old could serve as president until 2036, when he's 84 years old. Once that legislation passed, he did a Hitler. He began a campaign to remove all perceived opposition from his inner circle, just as his love buddy, Donald Trump. He sought to be surrounded only by emasculated yes-men like Donald Trump. Meanwhile, he conned a group of European nations to buy oil almost exclusively from Russia. A new pipeline from Russia to those countries has been completed. By establishing their energy dependency, Putin guaranteed a high degree of submissiveness. Remember, Donald Trump sought to denigrate and destroy NATO. Now, who would that have benefited? Because now NATO is the only thing between world peace and nuclear chaos. But Trump, the Donald, I call him the Don. I also call him Damien Thorne. Check out the movie, Damien Thorne remains a hero of a group of deplorables. The opinions on WCEG are my own and not my boss, so leave her alone. There's no copyright infringement because I got it right here. So if you want to sue somebody, sue me. And let me tell you something. I ain't got nothing for you to get. Okay. Now, some people with knowledge of the inner workings of the Russian government are indicating that Putin's recent behavior is somewhere between bizarre and insane. He has no opposition. He is free to do whatever his damaged mind wishes, just as his love buddy, Donald Trump. Meanwhile, Ukrainian citizens have had their lives upended in a way that has not happened since a deranged Adolf Hitler invaded Sudetenland. Look up your history. He convinced millions of people that that country was rightfully Germany's just like Putin, and Hitler did not stop, nor will Putin. If you think he's going to stop at Ukraine, think again. Most ignored by the news media, and this is a slight aside, is that America, my country, tis of thee, has the ability to become energy self-sufficient. Yes, we do. We have oil wells that are capped and not used so that we can give financial support to Saudi Arabia by purchasing billions of dollars of oil from them. This this dependency allows increased oil prices to be dictated by the Gulf Corporation Council, look it up, which exports 400,000 barrels per day, every day of oil. 400,000 barrels per day, every day. 
how quickly we have conveniently forgotten that the terrorist who attacked America on September 11, 2000, were from and initially trained in, hmm, help me out, help me out, Saudi Arabia. In fact, the United States president made sure that the Saudi Arabian delegation left Washington, D.C. before all flights in America were grounded. But we are known to easily forget, in fact, more easily than we forget. Okay, my folks out there, Theodore, Miss Kate, Mrs. Kate Boshia, and so many others, let's talk about prison reform. Now, today's program was supposed to be part four in a series of programs dealing with conditions within our prisons. Unfortunately, those with with, with whom those with whom lack of concern uh, have a lot of lack of concern about incarcerated persons should have been here. Now, I have featured Reverend Adar Adar Omar Fisher of Philadelphia. He is not only a dedicated uh, to prison reform, he is actively engaged in rehabilitation efforts. We featured several of his successful clients on our program last February. But you know what? Rehabilitation no longer exists in the prisons in Georgia or in these United States of America. I learned that a few weeks ago. That's pathetic. We featured several of his successful clients, like I said. Now, I have featured Georgia House of Representatives Kim Schofield, Sandra Scott, Roger Bruce, Roger Bruce and Rebecca Mitchell on issues and answers about prison reform. They are among a large and growing group attempting to push through legislation to bring Georgia prisons out of the 19th century when chain gangs were prevalent and where forced unpaid labor still exists. I found this out from talking to State Representative Rebecca Mitchell last week. Unbelievable. But guess who we have not heard from? We have not heard from any members of the State Properties Committee. All are members of the Georgia House of Representatives. Among them, Gerald Green, Emery Donahue, Clay Perkle, Debbie Buckner, Jody Lott, Carl Gilliard, Eddie Lumsden, Michael Smith, Bill Workheiser, and Mary Frances Williams. <clears throat> Excuse me. Only one senator, Sally Harrell, contacted me. She is a member of the state's institution, institutions and property committee. Other members are state senators Ed Harbison, Blake Tillery, Gail Davenport, Clint Dixon, Sonia Halpern, and Sheila McNeil. All, all of the aforementioned legislators are policy makers for Georgia prisons. All were sent a minimum of three emails by me. Only Sally Harrell responded twice. She apologized for having prior commitments, but asked for a link to our broadcasts, which were archived on YouTube. Do these legislators care? Or maybe they asked uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene for advice. Can you imagine that conversation? Well, let me go ask Marjorie and see what she thinks. Just talk to Marjorie, guess what? She said, forget all them. We don't care, they can't vote, so forget them. Yeah, probably what happened. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a poster person for racial intolerance and ignorant affinity for antebellum America. None of her ilk has any concern about prison reform, even though whites comprise 
57.7% of the prison population. Now I'm going to get to something that's going to offend a whole lot of people. I guess these incarcerated whites are treated as the whites of Appalachia. They suffer in silence and are ignored by whites in power and treated like rubbish. Whites of Appalachia speak up. White incarcerated prisoners speak up. Now, Marjorie Taylor Greene of Georgia, Governor Youngkin of Virginia, Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, and Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. I'm talking to all of you hypocrites who sacrifice your own poor just to marginalize, marginalize and victimize those identified as racial minorities and women. Let's see you do your racist dance during the Supreme Court screening of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. That's what I'm waiting for. And I hope you are too, because there needs to be a change in America. And maybe you guys will get it. Because you know what pro the problem is? The American demographic is changing. And these white races are in fear. They're in fear of you. That's why they're trying to subvert your ability to vote, folks. They're trying to subvert, subvert your ability to vote. And I don't want y'all to be like the people in South Fulton, Georgia, who think votes don't mean anything because the people of South Fulton, Georgia, now realize that votes mean something. And I'm going to talk about them in a minute. But first, let's go into some other stuff. And once again, if you have any questions, please, or comments, please, via Facebook, text them in, and uh, I'll be glad to comment on it because this is just not my uh, soapbox. It's also your opportunity to get your views in, just like you do on Facebook and Twitter and all those other little social medias. Excuse me. A pause that refreshes. Woo! All right, here's another hot topic. <clears throat> Critical race theory. Going to upset a lot of people here. Now, I'm quoting here from the New York Times. It's about how a, a complicated and expansive academic theory developed during when? When was it developed? The 1980s has become a hot button political issue 40 years later. Now, a little bit over a year ago, even as the United States was seized by protests against racism, many Americans never heard of the phrase critical race theory. Now, suddenly the term is everywhere. It makes national and international headlines and is a target for talking heads. Culture wars, wars over critical waste theory have turned school boards into battlegrounds. And in higher education, the term has been tangled up in tenure battles. So people are losing their jobs in colleges and universities over critical race theory. How about that? Dozens of the United States senator, senators have branded it activist indoctrination. How about that? Activist indoctrination. But critical race theory, or CRT as it is often abbreviated, is not new. Okay, now here's for the dummies in the Georgia Senate, in the Georgia state representatives, and all these, wow, I can't say what I want to say, but all of these racists who sit and talk about critical race theory and are, and are trying to change educational agendas that haven't been touched since 1954 with Brown versus Brown. You see, that's what they mean, folks, when they talk about MAGA and all, all this sort of stuff. It's going back to that and back other stuff. They, they want to take you back to slavery. They want to take you back to being among the uneducated. That's what it's all about. 
Now, this critical race theory gets people uncomfortable because you know what? People don't like to be told out about themselves. They don't, especially when these evangelical, praise the Lord, people are some of the biggest murderers, the greatest sinners in the world. And they all benefit by keeping their foot on the necks of people who only want to survive and thrive in these United States of America. That's off the top of my head. I didn't have that written down. Sorry. <laughs> now, the person widely credited with coming uh, the, up with the term critical race theory was Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, sister, law professor at UCLA School of Law and Columbia Law School. But critical race theory is not a single world view, worldview. The people who study it may disagree on some finer points, but as Professor Crenshaw put it, CRT is more a verb than a noun. I hate to tell you, but a lot of your state representatives and state senators don't know the difference between a verb and a noun. Am I right, y'all? Yeah, you know I'm right. But critical, uh, it, critical race theory, as described by the person who gave it the name, is a way of seeing, attending to, accounting for, tracing, and analyzing the ways that race is produced, the ways that racial inequality is facilitated, and the ways that our history has created these um, inequities or inequalities. That's, that's what it is. Um, so people who talk about that, at 90, or about critical race theory, 90% of them have no idea what they're talking about. And what I wanted to get into, let me say my notes are a little scrambled up here, but uh, once I get my teleprompter, or maybe I'll just wing it, because I can do that, because I got this. Right, Ms. Rogers? Last year, <clears throat> the protests over the killing of George Floyd prompted new conversations about structural racism, systemic racism, we might call it, in the United States. President Donald Trump, who we've talked about several times so far, some people can't, I've said his name more times today than some people have said it in 10 years, but it is what it is. President Donald Trump issued a memo to federal agencies that warned against critical race theory, labeling it as divisive, followed by an executive order barring any training that suggested the United States was fundamentally racist. His focus on critical race theory seemed to have originated with an interview he saw on huh, Fox News with some idiot named Christopher F. Rufo. He's a conservative, quote, scholar, end quote, now at Manhattan Institute, who told huh, Tucker Carlson the cult indoctrination of critical race theory. How about that? Now, let's talk a little bit about his almost majesty, Donald Humpty Dumpty Trump. Now, some of you don't pay attention. I paid attention to this the very first time I saw it, the very first time. In fact, when I mentioned it, no one knew what I was talking about. When I put it on Facebook, people defied me. People who don't know history, they defied me. But it's true. And here's the truth. Whenever possible, Donald Trump liked to be either photographed or gave speeches in front of the picture of President Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a wealthy slave owner. Under Andrew Jackson, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. To any of you 
remember that or what's that about? The Indian Removal Act. <sighs> that was when Native Americans that occurred in 1830, they were force marched from southeastern United States to reservations in Oklahoma. It's commonly called the Trail of Tears. Now, thousands of those Indians who were forced to walk thousands, hundreds of miles died. And where they died, they were left. They weren't buried. They were left there while the soldiers rode their horses and their wagons. It was genocide. But Donald Trump loved that. But he, Donald Trump, Trump, <laughs> Donald Trump said that Andrew Jackson was his uh, idol. And uh, the good thing about this, hey, Johnson or Jackson? I think it's Johnson. But um, those two are the only two presidents who were ever impeached in their first terms in office. Let's talk about something that's pretty sensitive to me. I've entitled this part, Left Behind. Left Behind and Forgotten. Who gets left behind? The No Child Left Behind Act of 2001 was the U.S. Act of Congress, which, which reauthorized the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It included Title I provisions applying to disadvantaged students, people like me. It supported standards based on uh, education reform, based on the premise that setting high standards and establishing measurable goals could improve individual outcomes in education. The act required states to develop assessments and basic skills to receive, to receive federal school funding States had to give these assessments to all students at select grades. The problem with this act is that individual school systems were incentivized to show that students in their systems were being successfully educated. If that did not occur, federal funding would be withdrawn. Thus, teachers were rated on how successfully they were teaching their students. Now, just as performance quotas corrupt police departments, this set the systems corrupted integrity challenge teachers and their superintendents. In 2011, widespread cheating by 178 teachers, principals, and a superintendent was discovered by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, thanks to a whistleblower. 82 teachers confessed to this largest cheating scandal in American history. Five fake teachers are currently due to be sentenced in criminal court in the very, very near future. And despicably, despicably, I'm using that word, put it in big caps, despicably, despicably, I can say that, we have state legislators and community activists who believe that college educated people who have connections to fraternity brothers and sorority sisters in judicial and government positions should not go to prison if they were part of a fraudulent conspiracy that adversely affected predominantly black children. In order to, to satisfy the no child left behind requirements, these teachers conspired together to change standardized test scores on children who were failing. These children were passed along through school until they graduated. Because of the fraudulent behavior of these criminalized teachers, 4,000 children were pushed out into the employment world, ill prepared to, to, see, to succeed. They were lacking in the basic skills we come to expect when a profession requires a high school diploma. Now I hear the weeping and gnashing of teeth from educated criminals who can voice their outrage of facing possible prison time and polysyllabic terms. 
these are the same people who wear Black Lives Matter buttons or T-shirts frequently and have the loudest voices when someone is slain by a police officer or a police officer is found guilty of corruption. They are the loudest voices in the lock them up or no justice, no peace crowd. Yeah, that's who they are. But who, who is protesting for those 4,000 mainly African-American students who were cheated out of a government mandated education in public schools in Atlanta? Where are the community activists or legislators sounding the bell of injustice and loudly demanding reparations for these children who are now young adults? Some of these improperly prepared students are now adults in prison. Pathetic. You don't need the lamp of Diogenes to see that there is not one. Could it be that most of the fake educators are African-American? Is that why we're not hearing anything? Is this a more obvious example of the need to sweep black on black crime under the rug of human decency? Because that is just what this is, folks. This is black on black crime. That's what it is. Face it. Deal with it. These 4,000 children do not have advocates in fraternities, sororities, or in masonry. You listening? Are you listening? Do you care? Do you give a damn? They are left behind. They are collateral damage incurred by the pursuit of greed, self-adulation, and elitism. Yep, I hear you frat brothers running around and your frat sorority sisters running around so proud of yourselves, but what have you done for these 4,000 children? Not a damn thing. Just as the education of African-American children has been proven to be second rate over centuries, these fake educators saw no harm in continuing that shameful legacy. This includes their supporters who believe that no incarceration is due for people who defrauded the government. They have forgotten that this government is of, by, and for the people. The government is not some invisible entity. It is clearly visible. Whenever you are walking down the street or on the highway, this is of, by, and for the people. Think about it. Fearing the loss of federal funding for their inability to properly educate children in Atlanta, these fake educators change test scores by altering answer sheets. These fake educators deserve to be treated the same as racketeers who engage in conspiracies to defraud businesses, governments, and individuals. They are of the same ilk, there's no doubt about it, and deserve to be treated equally under the law. They're racketeers, face it, just because they wear a suit and tie doesn't give them the privilege. Just because they went to college and graduated and got a degree and their mother and father are so proud of them doesn't make them any less a criminal. They messed over your children, your grandchildren. And why are you silent? So the next time I hear a Georgia representative or Georgia senator talk about reparations, you darn sure better be talking about reparations for these 4,000 children, or I'm going to call you out on it. Meanwhile, I'm waiting for all the megaphones screaming for reparations for slavery from the 17th through the 19th centuries to show their sincerity by championing reparations for these 4,000 children who may be forever, forever damaged by criminalized educators. Can I get a whisper of support? Maybe I need a hearing aid because I ain't hearing nothing. Man, oh man, oh man, nothing makes me more angry than that one. No child left behind. Well, let's talk about voting here. You know something? Here in the United States of America, nothing is more precious than voting. Nothing. Because voting determines 
a lot of what happens to all of us here in these United States of America. And I'm gonna call out South Fulton County, not South Fulton County, South Fulton City, Georgia. I'm calling you out because I talked about you a whole lot, built you up a whole lot over the past year. I heard South Fulton this and South Fulton that. I just went to a celebration for the former mayor of South Fulton, a man who did great work, great work in South Fulton. South Fulton. He was the first South Fulton mayor. Built South Fulton up. South Fulton is one of the most successful cities in the state of Georgia, economically and in so many other ways. South Fulton. But guess what? full of lazy people, full of people who have their tongues tied and people who they're lazy. Now you're suffering, some of you, and some of you are suffering because you kept silent. And I'm not gonna call out directly what you kept silent about, but let me say this. If you have a third class porn star in your government and you kept silent about it, and now you're complaining about stuff, guess what? It's your fault for keeping your mouth shut. You should have stood up and said something. So now deal with it. And when you get tired of dealing with it, speak on it, speak the truth. But whatever happens to that successful city, as it had been brought up by its first mayor, and other first representatives in your city council, if that fails, it falls on you for keeping your mouth shut. It falls on you. Let's talk about uh, politics, national and state. First person I want to talk about is Mr. Herschel Walker. Now, Herschel Walker is a former football player who was very, very popular with the Southern boys, the home boys at UGA. They loved them some Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker can't reason his way out of a paper bag, a wet paper bag at that. I'm giving him a break. Herschel Walker has a long reputation of abusing women, puts him in the class with Donald Trump who supports him greatly. And have you ever heard this college educated man talk? Does he talk like someone who needs to be a state Senator of Georgia? Huh? Do you know why he's being supported for state Senator of Georgia? Because he might have been a great he might have been a great running back, a great football player, but you know what? He's a handkerchief head. He is subservient to all the people who are dedicated to keeping a foot on your neck. That is who he is. And I had a picture that I wanted to put up there for you, but he is part of the GOP, but he ain't part of the head of the GOP. He's part of the tail of the GOP. OK, and he's too dumb to realize it, that he is being used or maybe he likes being used. I don't know. I'll move on. Vernon Jones, Republican. Crowd surfer. Yes, a boss. I love the laugh. Yes, a boss. Throw me around the crowd, boss. Vernon Jones. Now. He was planning to run for governor, but now he's changed. He wants to run for another office. He wants to run for Congress. He's another one being used, being used by people who have no love for African-American people. The only reason they're putting people like Vernon Jones up and Herschel Walker up is to divide the vote and pull votes away from Stacey Abrams. I sincerely hope from the bottom of my heart 
that the African-American people of the state of Georgia are not that stupid. Would you really want Herschel Walker to be your representative? Now there's a whole lot of money, a whole lot of money being put behind Herschel Walker by those Southern boys from UGA. They love this Herschel Walker. And they're gonna spend a whole lot of money, a whole lot of money. But Donald Trump, he loves his handkerchief heads. He loves them. And they ain't all men. Candace Owens, some of you might know her. Man, you can't tell her that she don't love her some Donald Trump. She does. <sighs> but she's another traitor. Not has anything. She's not for you, people of her color at all. Now, let me talk about another Republican that most of you may not have heard of. I'm going to talk about her real fast. Her name is Candace Taylor. I hadn't seen her name until a couple of days ago, and I was going to invite her to be on Issues and Answers. And then I look at, looked at her platform, and this is the Republican platform, Georgia, Metro Atlanta. And you folks in Metro Atlanta, you need to get your heads out of Metro Atlanta and get your heads really in the state and start paying attention to what's around you because Metro Atlanta does not control this state. This lady is not from Metro Atlanta. She's up there with Marjorie Taylor and these other hicks. As your governor, Ms. Candace Taylor says, I will ensure that every Georgian maintains their constitutional right to protect themselves. A right written in the foundation of our country as the Second Amendment. Without the ability to bear arms, we are vulnerable to a tyrannical government. Constitutional carry will be my first order of business as your Georgia governor. I want you to think about this in light of the insurrection. Without the ability to bear arms, we are vulnerable to a tyrannical government. Did you hear what she said? Do you hear that? Now, what if every black person in America back in the 1950s and 60s says, you know what, this is a tyrannical government and we're gonna take up arms and we're gonna change this thing around. It would not have been tolerated. A whole lot of people will either be dead or in jail, but this woman is running for governor. It's amazing, truly amazing. She's got some more idiotic things that are designed to, number one, she's against critical race theory, and uh, she is against voting rights. She's running for governor. Look out. And you know what? Don't be like the folks of South Fulton. Get out and vote. Don't be like the folks in Atlanta. Get out and vote. All right? If you get out and vote, we'll be all right, because I know you're intelligent enough to do the right thing. Now, we only have a little bit of time to go, and this is something that's very uh, near and dear to me. A lot of people will say that the greatest speech of Martin Luther King <clears throat> was the I Have a Dream speech. I beg to differ. In my opinion, it might have been the third best or the fourth best. It was not the best. But people in the media, they love stuff to tell you to tell you to dream. Oh, I have a dream. They want you to keep dreaming. They don't want you to be active. They don't want you to take control of your destiny. They don't want to feel you to feel empowered. They want you to dream and you be a sucker and buy it. You can't sit and dream. Martin Luther King told you that. And I'm going to repeat that. But before I get to that, his second best speech was his speech that he gave before he died. He was murdered. In that speech, if you ever look at it, this was a man who knew he was going to be murdered. He knew it that night. He knew it. And he stood there and I watched his face. And whenever I look at his face and look at his eyes, I think about my Lord and Savior, Yeshua ben Elohim, who, when faced with death, had to face being crucified on a cross and there was no way out for him. There was no way out for Doc, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King when he made that speech, no way out for him. He knew that. But this 
my friends, as I get ready to close out this program, and I thank you all for listening, is my favorite speech by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. It's called Your Life's Blueprint, subtitled A Psychological Speech. I want to ask you a question, and that is, what is your life's blueprint? This is the most important, crucial period of our lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint and that blueprint serves as a pattern, as the guide, as the model for those who are to build the building. And the building is not well erected without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. Now, each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. And I want to suggest, to suggest some of the things that should be in your life's blueprint. Number one, a principle of somebodiness. Number one in your life's blueprint should be a deep self-belief in your own dignity, your own worth, and your own somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you are nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. And always feel that your life has ultimate significance. Now, that means you should not be ashamed of your color. You know, it's very unfortunate that in so many instances, our society has placed a stigma on the Negro's color. You know, there are some Negroes who are ashamed of themselves. Don't be ashamed of your color. Don't be ashamed of your biological features. Somehow you must be able to, to say in your own lives, and really believe it, I am black, but beautiful. And believe that in your heart. And therefore, you need not be lured into purchasing cosmetics advertised to make you lighter. Neither do you need a pr to process your hair to make it appear straight. I have good hair, and it is as good as anybody else's in the world. And we've got to believe that. Now, in your life's blueprint, be sure that you have a principle of somebodiness. Number two, determination to achieve excellence. Secondly, in your life's blueprint, you must have a basic principle, the determination to achieve excellence in your various fields of endeavor. You're going to be deciding as the days and years unfold what you will do in life, what your life's work will be. And once you discover what it will be, set out to do it and to do it well. And I say to you, my young friends, that doors are opening to each of you. Doors of opportunity are open to each of you that were not open to your mothers and your fathers. And the great challenge facing you is to be ready to enter those doors as they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great essayist, said in a lecture back in 1871 that if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. This hadn't always been true, but it will become increasingly true. And so I urge you to study hard, to burn the midnight oil, I will say to you, don't drop out of school. And I understand all of the sociological reasons why we often drop out of school. But I urge you, in spite of your economic plight, in spite of your situation, that you are forced to live so often with intolerable conditions, stay in school. And when you discover what you're going to be in life and set out to do it, as if God Almighty called you 
at this particular moment in history to do it and just don't set out to be a, 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 a to do a good Negro job, but to do a good job that anybody could do. Don't set out to be just a good Negro doctor or a good Negro lawyer, a good Negro school teacher, a good Negro preacher, a good Negro barber, a beautician, a good Negro skilled laborer. For if you set out to do that, you have already flunked your matriculation exam into the entrance into the University of Integration. So set out to do a good job and do that job so well that the living, the dead, and the unborn couldn't do it better. If it falls to your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, Sweep streets like Leotine Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera and sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that the host of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper, <coughs> excuse me, who swept his job well. <coughs> excuse me. If you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. I can't say it any better. That is one of the poems or one of the speeches that I have lived my life by. And I hope that all of you, all of you are able to take something from what we have take, gone into today here at WCEG, where we speak life into the community. I, I want you to know that in the very near future, we're going to be coming back to the topic of prison reform. We're also going to be dealing with the topic of the death penalty. We're going to deal with the topic, topic of whistleblowers and law enforcement that I wanted to get to today, but we didn't, just didn't have enough time to do that. But know that we're going to talk about that because I think that there are people in law enforcement who need to be supported, uh, who need to be heard, and they're willing to talk. They're willing to inform you. But they need the support from our government leaders. They need the community support because that's the way that we're going to change things around in this country and stop some of the oppressive tactics that some police department are, used, are using to harm people and to keep people from pursuing the American dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And before I close out, I just want to remind everybody that we need to be mindful of what's going on in the world right now. We are just an ignorant man's whim away from a nuclear war. And uh, we need to be mindful of that. And we need to pay attention. And uh, we all need to pray. I was going to get into something that I wanted to talk about by prayer. We just don't have the time, but I will tell you this. The prayer works. It's worked in my life. It can work in your life. And I don't care whether you, uh, you're a uh, Muslim, Christian, Jeodin. I don't care. Pray. And I call Jehudin by the name they were originally called. Because those of you who don't know, who aren't, who just don't know, there was no such thing as a letter J until the 14th century. There was no sound like the letter J until the 14th century. And every name that you hear from ancient times that use a J is a made up name. I could get into that later, but um, I don't like using made up names. That's why I call my Lord and Savior by his name, Yeshua. That was his name. It wasn't a made up name. I think he hears me when I call him by that name. 
And when I'm standing before those pearly gates in judgment, I will call him by the name that his mother called, that his disciples called him, because I want to be heard above the crowd that are calling him by that made up name that was given to us by people who hated Jews. That's where that other name came from. And every time we use it, those who we're supporting, those teachers. So anyway, I wanna thank you all for listening to WCEG, this installment of Issues and Answers. We have some big programs coming up to you in March. And I hope and pray that all of you will listen. I hope and pray that all of you will learn and please uh, contact me by Facebook or through the station, any program suggestions or ideas that you would like for us uh, to delve into. We're gonna be getting into a lot of things, a lot of pro productive, progressive things here in the very near future. So I thank you all for joining us here on WCEG. When the world is at peace, will we all be in one piece? Thank you for tuning into WCEG. Have a good day.